start with the uh, the uh, story that has just come out over the last few days that the state of Connecticut financially has a big cash flow problem. I mean, you're in the Senate. You know what's going on. What can you tell our audience? And Senator, you and Representative Candelora, you have talked about this now for over a year, and it seems to have fallen on the deaf ears of the administration. Senator, how's the congressional campaign going? Of course, you're in a primary fight. How's that going? Well, it's going, it's going well. And I was very pleased uh, to receive the endorsement of my party at the convention that we had uh, in May as a, as a convention center in Hartford. Being the party endorsed candidate, I think, is, is good evidence that um, people believe that my message is a message that can win the fifth district in November and that I have the skills uh, to hit the ground running. When I get to Washington, D.C., I know what it means to serve the public. I know what it means to stand up against um, tax hikes and excessive borrowing. Okay. In Hartford, I've been the leading Republican on the Finance Committee, which, is, which means that it's been my job um, to stand up to Governor Malloy and to tell him why it is his fiscal policies are bad, bad for the state of Medicaid. Well, now you even have the state treasurer, Denise Napier, concerned about the, the bonding authority that's been given to the Connecticut Higher Education Supplemental Loan Authority. Talk about that. Well, we're going to have a bond commission meeting on Friday, um, Dan, and I hope the treasurer is there because I have some questions, and I think the people of Connecticut uh, should have some questions. If the governor's office is choosing to disregard the advice that comes from our elected state treasurer, uh, I think that's something that the Bond Commission needs to talk about. So I'm looking forward to our meeting on Friday, and I'm, I'm hoping that we have a chance uh, to have some of our questions answered. I want to get back to Representative Candelora for just a moment, because he emailed us last week saying that the state will run out of cash come July 20th, but that we are spending to operate the state on a monthly basis $2 billion. Now, my math says that comes out to $24 billion a year, how can that be when our state budget is $20.7 billion? No, I, I haven't seen uh, Representative Candelora's calculations, but I certainly don't doubt them. Um, you know, we, uh, I, a lot of it may be the timing of when we pay for things. You know, we don't, despite the governor's promises that we would implement gap accounting, we still haven't done that. So there's, there's, a, there's some razzle-dazzle that takes place with the state's finances. Uh, we put things off, um, and, then when, and then when we get the cash in, we pay our, we pay our bills. So I'm not completely, um, I don't completely understand uh, Representative Candelora's numbers, but if I were to look at them, I'm sure that he would be able to, uh, to educate both me and you. I'm sure, too. Now, I'm sure you know that uh, Christopher Donovan, who was the convention-endorsed candidate for Congress for the Democrats, and it could be uh, you against uh, Donovan in the fall election, spoke to the Kent Democratic Town Committee the other night, and when he was asked about your candidacy and your popularity, he said, this is according to a Republican-American story, 
there are two Andrew Rohrbecks. Andrew Rohrbeck, the nice guy, and Andrew Rohrbeck, the politician, whose first vote would be for John Boehner if he got to Congress. What do you say to that? Well, uh, I know Chris Donovan well, and what I would tell him is there's only one Andrew Rohrbeck. And Andrew Rohrbeck has been um, serving the people of this part of Connecticut for many years and serving all of the people. And I would also say there's only one Chris Donovan. And the reason I decided to run for Congress, one of, one of the biggest reasons I jumped into this race was because I don't want Chris Donovan to be my congressman. I've watched him in Hartford, and the values that he embodies are not the values that I want speaking for me in the United States Congress. But Chris Donovan has never seen the tax hike he didn't embrace. He views business as the enemy. He doesn't understand that his policies are what are responsible for Connecticut's economic challenges. So um, nothing would make me happier than to have the opportunity to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Chris Donovan from now until November 6th. Explain to our audience uh, your philosophy. I mean, I know you outlined it in general terms, but uh, what, what's your approach? What would you be as a congressman? Well, first of all, I think the way we grow our economy is by making it easier for business to thrive. And the way we make it easier for business to thrive is to reduce regulations, not increase them, to reduce taxes, not increase them, so if we want this country to prosper, the only way we're going to get more tax revenue is if we have more taxpayers. And the only way to have more taxpayers is to have more jobs. So my philosophy is government should get out of the way, allow this community to do what it does best, which is employ people, make money, prosper. And to that, that's the only way the government is going to be able to um, increase the amount of revenue that comes into our costs. Senator, a couple of more questions. One, your take on the Supreme Court's ruling regarding immigration. Well, I think that you know, I certainly, um, my, my take is that they certainly got it right in terms of allowing um, police, if they arrest you for burglary, they ought to be able to ask you, are you in this country legally? I mean, to me, the fact that that, that, that was ever in doubt is kind of amazing. Um, the other parts of the ruling, I haven't read the ruling, I, I want to read the ruling, because it's some pretty complicated areas of constitutional law. And so um, I think that, um, in general, the people of Arizona uh, ought to be given more power to uh, control what's happening in their state uh, there is a balance between federal and state power, and uh, in general, my bias would be to give the states that are closest to the ground additional authority uh, to make sure that, that people are, are abiding by the law. And any guesses as to what that Supreme Court ruling on Obamacare will be tomorrow? Oh, I thought if I were a betting person, I think the smart money is uh, predicting that the Supreme Court will strike down this law. You know, the, the individual mandate is one of the biggest overreaches of federal power that this country has ever witnessed. And um, I think that the people that were in the courtroom when this case was argued um, left the courtroom with a pretty strong feeling that the court would uh, strike down uh, at least the individual mandate part. And I think if that part goes down, it's hard to imagine the rest of the bill surviving. Well, that's my point. If it does go down, what's to stop the administration from continuing its uh, health insurance exchanges, or even coming up with a national health insurance policy if that itself is not outlawed? Well, I mean, here's the deal, Dan. That's only going to happen if Congress votes to have that happen. And that's why it's so important that there be a Republican Congress. When this bill was passed, the Democrats controlled Congress. Uh, my hope is, and my belief is, that but first of all, my, my belief is the president's not going to be reelected. So uh, we're going to start from scratch. We're going to take a much more um, constructive approach to addressing this problem. And we do have a national problem when it comes to health insurance. But 
But I think the answer lies in our state capitals, not in Washington, D.C. Senator, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Good luck. Oh, thank you, Dan. I appreciate your interest in the problem. Look, we're all going to be waiting tomorrow to see what the court says. So, but it would be an interesting day. Okay, thank you, Senator. You take care. Senator Andrew Rohrbach, and he, of course,